<laughs> Good evening. I'm Michelle Moore for CTV, uh, for CTV Live News, a weekly news and analysis program produced by CTV, your community television station. So today's program is going to be discussion about the inquiry, um, a call for public inquiry on the, the police repression uh, and political repression um, that a lot of us uh, lived through during uh, the student strike. Um, last week's show left you with a video um, from La, la Classe, uh, l'Association des Juristes Progressistes, as well as La Ligue des Droits Liberté. And uh, this video was basically a call out um, for uh, witness testimony about um, vi victims of uh, repression and oppression during the strike. Um, and if you feel that you know um, this fits the bill for you, then uh, you can share your testimony at um, témoignage à commercial ligue des droits .ca by October 15th. So that's this Monday. Um, so we can recall that during the student strike, uh, there were about 3,000 arrests, as well as um, a lot of injuries, both physical and psychological. And um, our constitutional right to peaceful assembly, our right to protest, was like repeatedly under attack, um, whether it was through repressive laws like Bill 78 or um, the really violent means that the uh, riot police uh, used to um, kind of disperse the uh, protesters. Um, so to address this problem, last Saturday there was actually an anti-police brutality protest um, with regards to specifically the uh, brutality that um, took place during the Maple Spring. And um, even last Saturday, like without any um, cause, no, no violence took place or anything on the part of the protesters, uh, the presence of riot police was still very, very prominent. Um, so our guest for this evening will be Carl Curry, who is a member here at CUTV and um, was a cameraman for many of our live broad broadcasts during the student demonstrations last spring. Uh, welcome to the program, Carl. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, so the topic for today's show is police repression during the student strike, um, but we want to turn your attention to one specific very special police officer, um, Constable 728, um, Stephanie Trudeau. So Trudeau was in the news again yesterday um, after a video uh, released of her, um, of her brutally arresting some artists in the plateau um, for drinking uh, a beer on the sidewalk. Um, the video and a recorded cell phone conversation have become the subject of like Montreal media for the last couple days and a lot of controversy and has led to Constable 728 being suspended by the SPVM. So um, Carl actually shot the initial video that made uh, Constable 728 uh, somewhat of a, a famous uh, person and a famous figure um, in the strike um, back in May, May 19th. And uh, that was the same weekend that uh, Law 78 was actually put in place. So let's have a look at that video now. Je vais pas bouger. 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 Je vais pas bouger.
Donc, c'était quoi la raison d'asperger le monsieur, madame? On vous parle poliment. Vos collègues n'ont pas été comme vous. C'est des policiers corrompus. Non, mais il y en a juste une dans la gang. C'est 7 de 8. On va s'en rappeler. Ils sont corrompus, les gars. Ils sont corrompus. Ah oui, c'est à peu près le temps que vous le mettez dans votre poche, ça. Il n'y a personne ici qui est violent, madame. 7 de 8, vous allez vous en rappeler, 7 de 8. On le sait, vous êtes un bon. autre bord. Ils ont des vidéos de musique sale. avec vous. Ça vous fait chier, tu veux les ordres, ça vous fait chier. Ouais, ils font 40 000 par année, c'est juste pour un couloir. Ils n'ont pas 40, mon ami. Hein? Pas 40, euh, 75, 80. C'est pas vrai que c'est des vidéos de musique. Au début, au début, ils font 40. Après ça, quand ils mordent, ils font du temps en ce moment. Anyway, 7, 2, 8, vous allez passer au cage. Allez-y. Policiers corrompus. Appuyez pas la mafia, comment on dit mieux que ça. Ah mais au moins c'est une force. Faites 2-8, le monde alentour de vous, ils font pas ça. Vous, signé vous, les, vous, vous allez faire quoi avec nous On est loin de vous en ce moment. Les autres policiers ils ont rien fait. 7 de 8 à l'asperge du monde. On se recule, il n'y a pas de problème. Vous êtes une fasciste, madame. Vous êtes une fasciste. Fasciste! Vous êtes une fasciste, 7 de 8! 7 de 8 demain, là! Vous allez être une star! Une star, 7 de 8! Vous allez être une star! Vous êtes vraiment bonne! Bonne soirée, madame! Exactement! Vous êtes la honte de tout le reste de votre section! To go after that. It's not the same type of critiques. Welcome back. Um, Carl, can you tell us about the, the video? What kind of uh, feeling was on the streets that night? At that point, I mean, earlier in the night there was a demonstration, and if I'm not mistaken, that was the night that the law had just come out. I don't think it was being put into effect yet, but uh, the Projet de loi 78, so Law 12, yeah. it eventually became. <clears throat> and I remember that it was quite electric and that we uh, went, I, I'm 99% sure it's the same night we went, gone through McGill and whatnot, and the repressions. And so by the time we got down to uh, Place Emilie Gamelin, um, it, the, the, it was extremely tense. The police were extremely aggressive, probably the most aggressive I'd seen them in a sustained manner. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really that they were trying to defend uh, Place Emilie Gamelin and not let anyone in. And so at that point, I did see, I mean, a lot of stun grenades, a lot of tear gas and whatnot. Just previous to me filming that, I was on um, St. Catharines, just east of uh, St. Hubert, and uh, they were clearing people. And uh, actually, that's where I first met up with uh, l'agent 728, who had filmed, um, and she basically checks, uh, body checks uh, uh, a guy who was trying to they were, they were asking people to clear the street, so this guy was clearing, and as he was getting cleared, he was getting roughed up by other policemen, but as he was leaving, the other police uh, left him alone, he, uh, she just came and just like hit him with a, her big, nice stick. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so the, 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 it was quite, quite tense that night, and, and yeah. Um, I'm told that before, um, before you shot the, the now famous video, um, there was also another video you shot about five minutes right, about... Right, that's, that's what I was saying. Yeah, it was just, just at that, it was just before that, while they were clearing, um, that, uh, that he had, uh, she, had, she had hit that, that man, uh, another man, the okay. one that was filmed after. So, yeah. Um, so, um, the, the video, um, it, I mean, it went viral, you know this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 300,000, 500,000 views. Um, so why do you think so many people have watched this video in particular? Hmm. Um, you know, when I was filming it, I was, as soon as I saw what happened, I was filming down the street and there was a whole bunch of people that were, I was thinking it's quite humorous, people that were uh, chanting, Libérer les chevaux, so free the horses, when referring to the mounted police. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and I, I saw the corner of my eye that she had hit another protester that was leaving the street. So if you're leaving, you're complying with a police order. So I really don't see how legally a police mm -hmm. can take physical action towards you if you're complying with the orders and you're not a danger to anyone. So she hits this guy. The guy turns around and starts to tell her, you know what, at a, at a comfortable distance, at least two meters away, and starts telling her, you know what, I don't need you to hit me. I can hit myself. And he like kind of slaps himself. 
And so I was just seeing that while I was still filming that way. And it was right there that I turned. And then you see she goes, she pulls out her, um, her pepper spray and sprays him, sprays the other people. And as soon as I saw that, I realized, because I was filming it, I realized I'd equated it with what had happened uh, in New York City with, uh, what was that sergeant's name? Um, I can't quite remember, Anthony, Anthony Bologna. And so when, and he became famous doing that. So I think a lot of it has to do with that because in, at the moment that I filmed it, I just went right to her and I asked her for her, uh, her uh, number, her numéro de dimatricule. And it was the other guy, obviously, that I think you guys just saw in the video, that, uh, that knew the number. And I knew at that point, I'm going to make her famous. Like, I just want to, I didn't think it would become that big, but mm -hmm. I just wanted her to, 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 to feel what it was to, to, to be on the other side and to be vulnerable like the people that she was attacking. So I think a lot of it had to do with that prior experience of seeing things like that happening in New York City, uh, in San Francisco as well was happening on the Berkeley campus. And, uh, and yeah, so I think a lot of it, uh, plus it was happening here too, so people saw that and it just enraged them. Yeah, um, but what, what drove you to, to shoot the video rather than run away like a lot of other people might have done? I was indignant, I was enraged by what she did. When she sprayed that guy, I thought it was horrible and it was unjustified. But when she turned around and then sprayed the, the, the three women that were on the side, to me, at that point, I didn't really didn't mind getting arrested. I wanted to film this, like I just knew at that point that I was gonna film her and put her on YouTube and call mm -hmm. her out for what she'd done. I didn't know that you'd get hundreds of thousands of people, but I knew that there'd be an, at least a student community and whatnot would start to look at these things. And yeah, so to me it was actually, if anything, Near the end of the video, there's the guy that originally got sprayed told me to stop um, stop going after her because he didn't want me getting arrested because he needed the footage to uh, okay. to complain. Um, has he contacted you for that footage? He never did. He took my phone number. He never got back in touch with me. <laughs> we came so Take it right off YouTube. That's true. And now, um, you know, courses have gone into uh, suspending the uh, agent in question with, uh, with or without his phone call to you. So mm -hmm. um, it seems that it's worked out for him anyway. Um, so I'm just wondering, are there, um, are there any other instances of like extreme police brutality that you could tell us about that you've been witness to? Um, you know, I, what, what, what I saw was even that night, a little bit earlier, I was seeing sometimes you'd see two different types of policemen. Some that are doing their job and following orders, and others that just take the, viol take the, the, their, the law into their own hands. Mm -hmm. And so you'd see in the same frame, you see police pushing back two people. And they're both backing up, so they're complying with a police order. And as they comply with the police order, one is getting hit by a police where the other police is just telling him, please move back, please move back. So you see two different behaviors in the same situation, in the same frame of my, <laughs> my camera. Yeah. And so y to me, that's really what this whole thing is about, is that there is a tolerance for certain police to act like this. There's others that actually do their job. And, and we might not like the orders, but the orders come from above. And that's where we'd have to direct our anger. But instead, we're stuck directing our anger at these small little... Yeah. men and women. But I've also heard it be, uh, being suggested as well that um, really all it is when we see, uh, you know, is a little bit of the good cop, bad cop routine, you know? I mean, what are the chances that it's... I did, in, that, in that situation, I can almost guarantee that what I was just referring to wasn't a good cop, bad cop. You really saw that one was hitting, the other one was, you could see it in his face, he was just trying to be the opposite, but not in the good cop, bad cop. One person was, was being pushed back, the other one was stepping back on his own. Right. And both were voluntarily moving backwards, so did, I don't, yeah. Okay, because sometimes what we've seen with um, riot police is that the good cop will say, uh, oh, uh, I have to ask you to leave, please, you know, please circulate, and the bad cop will be like, I'm ordering you to leave, you know? In, in either case, I don't see a huge problem with that. It's more when one policeman's being nice and the other one is hitting you. That's what I take exception to, you know, and the rest is, well, it's part of, I guess, our <laughs> game and their game and, uh, and the politician's game. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to take a short break um, to look at uh, um, a program that's been developed before by the members of the community. Um, and it's uh, basically a short video on documented immigrant children in Quebec um, and public schools. And following that, we'll also be seeing a report on the uh, law that took place in Montreal. Um, do stay with us. We'll be right back with Carl. À ce moment-ci de l'année au Québec, les enfants sont dans leur salle de cours en train d'apprendre, de partager, de découvrir et d'interagir avec les autres à l'école. Mais pour près d'une centaine d'enfants à Montréal, ce n'est pas le cas. 
On estime qu'il y a environ 40 000 migrants sans papier dans la métropole, dont plusieurs centaines sont des enfants. Ils sont dans l'impossibilité d'avoir accès à l'éducation gratuite en raison de leur statut d'immigration. Bien souvent, ce sont les parents qui travaillent en dessous de la table dans des conditions déplorables et qui laissent leurs enfants chez eux, en attendant l'acceptation de leur dossier chez Immigration Canada, ce qui peut prendre jusqu'à quelques années. En tout cas, comment ils vivent, c'est euh, désespérant, c'est abominable. Enfin, il y a un énorme sentiment de culpabilité, je pense, pour les, euh, les parents, de ce qu'on fait subir aux enfants qui ne peuvent, euh, peuvent pas être scolarisés, qui n'ont pas une vie normale. Nous avons parlé avec Judith Rouen d'origine française, installée ici depuis 2010 et membre du collectif Éducation sans frontières pour évaluer la situation davantage. En France, on, on s'inscrit à l'école sans... On n'a pas besoin d'avoir des papiers euh, d'immigration légaux, contrairement à ici. Au Québec, la loi est claire. Pas de papier, pas d'éducation gratuite. Et même si les parents déboursent le 6 000 de frais de scolarité, il y a la question de la légitimité du diplôme. Il y a des familles qui arrivent à inscrire leurs enfants dans des écoles privées, très privées, donc qui payent très cher. Mais là encore, la question des diplômes, ça se pose pareil, parce que les, les écoles privées ne peuvent pas déclarer ces enfants-là. Admettons qu'on soit inscrit dans une école parce que le, la direction a été plus ou moins bienveillante, mais comme elle ne peut pas déclarer l'enfant, de toute façon, il n'aura pas de code permanent. Et donc, il va faire 5 ans dans, ou 6 ans dans une école primaire et il n'aura pas de diplôme valide en fait, et reconnu. En Ontario, la loi indique que tout enfant a droit à l'éducation, peu importe son statut d'immigration. Une pratique déjà existante dans plusieurs pays d'Europe et quelques États aux États-Unis comme le Texas, où il y a le plus grand nombre de sans-papiers au pays. Toutefois, même à Toronto, cette loi est seulement appliquée une fois sur sept, selon une étude publiée par Social Planning Toronto. Donc, eux, les commissions scolaires disent qu'eux, ils, ils connaissent un peu mieux la réalité parce qu'ils sont quand même au contact avec les familles. Et que ce qu'ils font, c'est que souvent, ils acceptent de les inscrire et qu'ils euh, vont accompagner plus ou moins les familles pour, euh, pour qu'ils obtiennent des papiers. C'est-à-dire qu'ils vont dire aux familles, ben, il faut, faut faire des démarches pour avoir des papiers, etc. Comme si, en fait, les familles, un, ne faisaient pas ce genre de démarche. Alors que c'est évident parce que euh, vivre sans papier dans une société, euh, c'est quasiment impossible parce qu'on est dans un statut d'illégalité permanente. Les commissions scolaires de Toronto et de Montréal ont refusé de commenter sur la situation. Ce que disaient, c'était des, des chercheurs à McGill qui avaient calculé que finalement, les gens qui sont sans papier et qui vivent ici, il y en a beaucoup qui ne rentreront pas et qui à terme vont avoir leur papier parce qu'ils vont faire des démarches, etc. Donc en fait, si on prend un enfant de 10 ans par exemple, euh, si dans 5, 6, 7 ans après, il a ses papiers, il va être un citoyen canadien et résident québécois. Et donc ça va être quelqu'un qui ne sera pas éduqué, ça va être quelqu'un qui ne euh, rendra pas, si on peut parler comme ça, moi je ne suis pas dans ce discours-là, mais qui ne rendra pas à la société euh, et qui ne sera pas productif. Et ça va être quelqu'un qui va être assisté en gros. Donc finalement, il vaut bien mieux lui offrir l'éducation, parce que de toute façon, il vivra dans la société québécoise et s'il est éduqué, il pourra être productif pour la société québécoise. Le, la, la question de la nationalité et de la citoyenneté, ça, ça fait des différentes catégories d'êtres humains. Il y a des êtres humains parce qu'ils ont un papier, parce qu'ils ont eu de la chance dans leur vie, parce que si, parce que là, ils ont ces papiers-là, soit c'est des nationaux, soit ils ont, comme moi, ils ont facilement des papiers pour pouvoir voyager, bouger, etc. Puis il y a des êtres humains qui n'ont pas droit et à qui, justement, on nie tout, tout droit humain et les droits de base, quoi. Alors que c'est pour beaucoup une question de chance. Et donc, moi, je trouve ça insupportable. Le 13 octobre prochain, le collectif Éducation sans frontières organise une journée de sensibilisation dans le cadre de leur projet Une cité sans frontières. Pour plus d'informations, veuillez visiter le www.solidaritésansfrontières.org. À ce moment... It's been 19 years since the death of local businessman Ron Farah. Farah's foundation held the first edition of Samarche a year before AIDS took his life. And despite a receding turnout, the walk continues in the hopes of raising awareness about the sickness.
What the foundation does is we raise money and then we redistribute it to partner groups across the province. So there are a lot more programs that are you know, focusing on youth and uh, prevention education uh, measures and those are the kinds of programs that you know, people should come to the foundation and request funds for because you know, those are the kinds of programs that are really necessary today so that we can see a future without AIDS. Increasing public apathy was a fear shared by most of the participating organizations, including Vanier Sijap. It's hard, right? Um, it's hard to even get the media involved anymore because everybody's become quite complacent. If something doesn't happen quickly, um, a lot of people aren't in it for the long term. I work in Africa, I work in Malawi, I'll be taking students there again in March, and we see the devastation of AIDS, it's everywhere. Families are torn apart, people, uh, you know, family uh, households are led by children, so it's very much in your face. Here in Canada, it's hidden. And when things are hidden, it no longer stays on people's agendas. And so what more can we do? Um, I don't know that we haven't already done. I think that's the question the Fair Foundation probably asks himself every year. Such complacency was not felt by the estimated 3,000 walkers. They raised around $240,000. And while most walked, some decided to dance as nonprofit organization Head & Hands did. So in 2008, we decided rather than to walk the march, we decided to dance the march. Um, we wanted to celebrate the joys of joyful parts of people living with HIV and also um, the joyful parts of doing HIV prevention and care work. We do a lot of sex education and it's super, super fun. Um, so we wanted to bring that energy and say, you know what, this is not only um, a really sad thing, it can also be a really joyful thing, and so we make that choice. And despite the cold and eminent rain, walkers and dancers alike were out today to support a great cause. Jamie Floyd, CUTV. Uh, you're still here with Michelle and Carl. Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, following the uh, recent events um, that we have seen on the news about Stephanie Trudeau, like what's what's your reaction to that? It's a mixture of uh, being completely horrified and uh, and laughing a lot because <laughs> I just it's just so ridiculous that uh, that. Sh what what really freaks me out is the fact that there is no proper policing of the police. And once again, I'm the, I've got no problem with police in general, especially when they're doing their job and following their rules. And I'm sure it's a, and not an easy job to do. But in the same time, I, uh, for somebody who's like that, who's so totally inept and probably has emotional issues, I mean, I'll try to be a little bit uh, uh, understanding with her. Well, she shouldn't be in the force to begin with. Mm -hmm. I think another problem, I work with police very often in, in, in my real job. And, uh, and I spoke to them and they were telling me that when the recruitment for the, 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 the riot police, for the regular riot police, <coughs> was basically a paper put on the wall and you put your name on. It seems to me that the police should, all of these police have psychological assessments and they should be picking the creme de la creme of those who have tested and also experience wise have proven to, 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 to work well uh, under stress, under fire, even if sometimes some of the protesters are behaving badly or whatnot, they should be able to stay, I mean. Yeah, um, during the height of the strike, they actually lowered the, uh, the uh, qualifications for riot police because they were, there was just such dire need for them that, mm -hmm. um, you know, rookies were just <coughs> sent right in, so. Absolutely, but I mean, that's exactly, it. We're, we're lucky that no one got killed. And I mean, there's been a few eyes lost and uh, a girl lost her dentition. And mm -hmm. so, uh, I mean, uh, to me, at a certain point, then bring in police from somewhere else, do what you gotta do. But if, if that's what needs to be done, yeah. um, I mean, uh, then again, that could also be argued, but that's not in the, in the police's. Uh, <laughs> I think a lot of uh, the situation could have been uh, pacified uh, just by, uh, politicians speaking more diplomatically. Yeah. Um, why do you think it took so long for them? I mean, um, they could have suspended uh, Constable 728 like following the, uh, the, the video you produced, basically. They, there was yeah. grounds for it. Why do you think they waited until um, you know, she was caught uh, bad-mouthing some artists on the plateau? I mean, I, that is actually a direct result of this video, and uh, neither would have happened. So if I wouldn't have done the video, 
she would have gotten caught this time around, she would have right. not got, I'm sure wouldn't have gotten suspended. And I think what, the only reason she was suspended now is not because of her actions, but it's because of, of what she said and how she treated right. citizens. Mm. I just don't know if that's really the, 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 the most important part. I think the violence that she, for someone mm -hmm. drinking a beer right outside their own house, I mean, at their door, and to, to violently attack them, even because they question why you're, they're being asked their ID. That, yeah. I think you're always allowed to ask why. Of course. You know, as yeah. long as that's not, be, you're not, you're not putting the police, the police person's life in danger or security in danger. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I think I think the real problem behind that is the fraternity, the police fraternity, and uh, and the overprotection of people who don't deserve it. There needs to be a change of mentality, a change of uh, a vision of what it is to be a police person, to 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 be there, to be a to be protecting the peace or to be protecting the order and whatnot and. And yeah, and I think that the, I, I, what we saw many times, people getting arrested, uh, women no larger than you with four guys on top of them, uh, w is that necessary? And then we get to a fundamental question, what's more important, the relative security of a police person mm -hmm. or the basic civil rights of uh, the population? Yeah, and it seems that with her being suspended now, it's a lot more about um, a worry about appearances as, of course. you know, people being hurt. Yeah, I hope. So. I mean, she, fine, she's suspended even if she's lost. A, with she, pay. She, yeah, <laughs> but even if she's thrown out of the police, that's not going to change anything. What needs to be changed is this type of attitude. And that environment where other police will have to, they have to stick together and they have to stick together. I think that's what's... Uh, that's missing in their education, I think, uh, when or their training, is that it's not us against them. I think most people, maybe until recently, <laughs> didn't view the police. They, they viewed it as a necessity, and if you're being, sp I've been, had cops come over to my place and tell me that the music was too loud when we were younger and whatnot, and did in such a hilarious way. And we obviously all complied, and we loved the guy, and the guy was a really great guy. We all left the, our apartment. He said, you don't have to leave, just put the music down. We're like, no, 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 we'll leave. The guy was totally nice. I've also had police, doing almost the same thing, busting into her house, <laughs> so breaking the law by doing that, and coming in and really ransacking the apartment, which, so there's two different ways of looking at this, and that's, I think, that needs to be addressed, and we need to, 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 um, to back the cops that are doing their job, and the ones that are on a power trip, well, sorry, you yeah. know, you need to be out, and that's it, and we'll, yeah. Well, just on the larger scope of things, I mean, do you think that um, that 728's behavior differs greatly from a lot of what we've seen during uh, the Maple Spring, or? I mean, it's arbitrary. I, I heard it. it. She is not an exception to the rule, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, to say that every single police person was like that, no, I, I wouldn't say that either. So I'd heard it time and time again, all kinds of vulgarity being screamed at us because of Carré Rouge. I was at a show right beside on the 4th of September when Napoleon Marois' assassination attempt happened. And as I was filming, the police leaving with the sort of AK-47, the, you know, the assault rifle, and I was just filming them on my iPhone, the policeman turned around and said, hey, ma'am, reste l'autre bord de la rue, which is fine. And then he says, carré rouge. And I'm like, what, is that really necessary? I'm not screaming at him, I'm not saying anything. And as soon as he said, ma'am, reste l'autre bord de la rue, I stopped. I stopped and I backed off, the t and I kind of understand, he's got an assault weapon in his hand right. and they saw what happened. But in the same time, what's the carré rouge for? Mm -hmm. What's all that? And Even saying, hey man, is very informal. Like this Sure, but I'll, I'll forgive that a lot more <laughs> than, uh, than, than the, the, like, because one is maybe just at the last second under stress. The other one is, well, it, it, it's more of a reflection of a mentality. Yeah, it's like a lack of pro professionalism of and it just, it can, well, you can tell through their so rhetoric. So all of us red square wearing, well, I'm not wearing mine today, but all of us red square wearing are, are, are the Pouillou, where we're, we're violent bums or whatever, well, mm -hmm. does that mean that all cops are pigs? And I refuse to say that, so I expect police to do the same. If I'm not going to sit there and call every cop a pig or a fascist, salpa, whatever, mm -hmm. then I believe that I have the right to the same kind of respect. So you're saying that cops who, you know, target us or call us carré rouge are like polarizing us the same way that, you know, certain more anarchist members would be like, oh, uh, you know, it's us against them and they're all... One I mean, time. look, I just think that it's like the carré rouge, well, fine, and mostly a whole bunch of white people wearing the carré rouge. We're getting a taste of what it is to be, maybe to feel that kind of discrimination if you're a black person, maybe in Montreal North or whatnot, and you're used to getting stopped all the time and having that discrimination. 
So I think, yeah, it's just a whole but all of a sudden there's an awakening of, of what this kind of thing happens. Or go to St. Henry or go wherever where police will take m bigger liberties than other parts of town. Mm -hmm. But why do you think that is what brings them to uh, think they can get away with certain things? Um, I think that's just a general, it's the culture. And, uh, and that's why the culture should be changed. And I mean real things be changed instead of, uh, instead of symbolic things like getting rid of this cop. 728, it's just one little thing. That's not going to change anything. Well, thank you very much. I certainly hope that we will see change one day or another, um, hopefully uh, soon, hopefully. <laughs> or then later. Um, so I'd like to thank you for being here tonight. Um, uh, Kyle Curry, a cameraman for CUTV. Um, and I'd like to thank also all of our viewers. Uh, for those of you...